Great. Can uh, can everyone hear me then? I think we've got everyone else muted. Um, also, can the host um, can you can you spotlight my video? Because I think that will make me the main uh, video on everyone else's screen. Oh, that works great. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to my slide presentation. Uh, let me restart that. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this presentation. I believe we have about 35 minutes together or so. Uh, I plan to speak for about 25 minutes and use the rest of the time to take questions and to hear from the rest of you. Uh, I will keep my camera running in the top right corner. Uh, hopefully you can see me there for most of the presentation. Uh, and I'm hoping that will help those who are deaf and hard of hearing. My name is Brian Tao. This is me down in the left of the photo, enjoying a bubble tea with some of my bright big readers. Uh, I'm coming to you live from the occupied lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas with the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Those of us who came after will know this better as the City of Toronto. Home to Bike Sauce, a community bike shop that I proudly volunteer with. Uh, I'm also a volunteer writer with the Bike Brigade, the topic of today's presentation. I'd like to present a brief overview of the Bike Brigade, how it came to be, what we do, how we do it, and why our work will remain relevant even after the pandemic dies down. I have two main objectives for this talk. First, to discover similar efforts elsewhere and to explore any opportunities for cooperation and mutual support. Second, if you're not currently involved in something like this, I hope to inspire and motivate you into taking action. I'll open this presentation with a two minute clip from a CBC News story about Bike Brigade that aired this past May. Hey. Uh, okay, we've got one large for you. Thank you. Okay. People need help and you can't help them staying at home. You can't help them behind a keyboard. You can't help them just sitting on your couch. Okay. There you go. Awesome. Have a good ride. Thanks so much. Lanrick Bennett Jr. is a member of something called the Bike Brigade, a volunteer group that crisscrosses the city seven days a week. It started because of the pandemic. When you know that your time and effort can be, can be better spent helping other people, how can you say no? Like, how can you? How are you today? The Bike Brigade works as a go-between. They pick up food from food banks and other agencies and bring it to people who, because of COVID, can't get it themselves. Instead of staying home when the pandemic started, these are the people who did the opposite. They went out to help. Carrie Shear has been with the Bike Brigade since the beginning. My first ride for the brigade was April 4th of 2020, and I remember that because it was three days after my parents tested positive for COVID-19. Those early days were so scary, they were so um, paralyzing, and I needed to do something with that, with that paralyzing uh, fear. What Carrie did was push back against it. She forced herself to do something more than worrying about her parents. I wanted to do something to feel like I had a little bit of control. I'm just kind of like sitting at home and seeing the scary numbers and the seeing the, the events unfolding. Um, I felt like there had to be something um, that I could do to kind of help out. So I, I signed up for the brigade and I was on a ride three days later. <laughs> Carrie has done hundreds of rides since. Getting on her bike and making deliveries has gotten her through the pandemic. It's lessened a lot of the fear that I have around COVID, knowing that um, my community is here for me and that I can be here for the community. And it's been really good for my sense of humanity and my hope. That was Lanrick and Carrie. They talked about some of the reasons we've all decided to get involved, despite the pandemic raging around us. Uh, in a nutshell, Bike Brigade's core focus is the last mile delivery of food and other crucial supplies to our disadvantaged neighborhoods. As shown here, these deliveries range from groceries and hot meals to face masks and medication to menstrual products to clothing and even art supplies. 
Our volunteers coordinate with outreach organizations and, of course, all of our deliveries are made by bike. In addition to our focus on logistics, the Bike Brigade has always been an unwavering advocate not only for the cycling community, but for our vulnerable populations. It is these systemic issues exacerbated by the pandemic that sparked the genesis of the Bike Brigade. This is David Shelnet, Ontario's biking lawyer and founder of the Bike Brigade. He notes, I think what the pandemic has done is highlight pre-existing problems in our society. Housing crises, food insecurity, racial injustice, you name it. These problems have existed since before the pandemic and need to be addressed. As the first lockdowns came into force, we saw elderly residents isolating at home, often finding it difficult to procure basic supplies like groceries and medication. David thought of his mom and figured others in his community were in the same boat. He put out an informal call to neighborhood cyclists who could help deliver supplies. Thus, the seed of the bike brigade was planted. One person who responded to that call was Rachel Wang. She has since become the executive director of the Bike Brigade. She speaks to CBC, uh, or sorry, she speaks to CTV News on the occasion of our first anniversary in March 2021. Dozens of volunteers today descended onto College Street to pick up fresh boxes of produce and to deliver it. And many of the riders say the nice weather today was just the cherry on top. It's a program pairing cyclists with community organizations or individuals. So we offer free delivery of food and other, other essential items across the city for our partners, doing that heavy lifting, filling those gaps in our system. Cyclists are picking up over 100 boxes of fresh produce and delivering them to those who are vulnerable or isolated. Yeah, I have a delivery on Sherbert today. You can tell by people's eyes that they're smiling. David Shelnut launched the program in the early days of the pandemic, but says food insecurity was a problem long before then. The pandemic has highlighted or illuminated systemic failures that predated what's going on right now, the housing crisis, food insecurity, racial injustice. This weekend marks the Bike Brigade's one-year anniversary, as well as its 5,000th donated food share delivery box. Volunteers have cycled more than 20,000 kilometers to make it happen, and in all kinds of weather. I mean, we prefer the sunshine, but like we've done it in the sleet, we've done it in the snow. Our riders are incredible. And organizers say they'll continue to offer their services as long as there's a need. And of course, they're always looking for more volunteers. Yeah, it may be difficult to interpret uh, some of those newscasts because I don't really have any control over uh, over the speed. Um, anyway, today, the Bike Brigade is run by a collective of cycling organizers and community members. There are nearly 600 active riders, 15 logistics coordinators, eight on the technology team, and even an academic research team of four. Uh, we are partnered with dozens of community outreach and mutual aid organizations, some of which are represented here. They range from food banks to mental health support organizations, to respite centers, to safe spaces for LGBTQ and survivors of sexual assault. Deliveries for those organizations run seven days a week, all year round. As Kerry pointed out, it doesn't matter if we have sunshine or sleet, bike brigade riders always show up in force. I personally completed over 300 deliveries in the 18 months I volunteered with Bike Brigade. In fact, our weekly food share delivery run is happening right now with 40 some riders delivering over 1200 pounds of groceries all over downtown Toronto. So what is a typical day for me as a bike brigade volunteer? What tools and resources does your organization provide to its riders to keep everything running smoothly? I'll have days where I've signed up for four or five different campaigns, all with different pickup and drop off points and each with their own unique set of requirements and procedures. It would be far too easy to inadvertently confuse my pickup and drop off schedules without good planning. But before I get into that, let me take a step back and talk about how a rider signs up for a delivery. Bike Brigade hosts an online schedule of all deliveries for the upcoming week. It's not unusual to see 20 or 30 delivery runs scheduled in a single week. Riders sign up based on their availability, carrying capacity, and riding ability. 
Very often, the same people will sign up for the same days each week, which is a great way to get to know the people you're delivering to. Signups are recorded either with a shared spreadsheet or an online form. Details such as the pickup location, drop-off area, type of delivery, item sizes and counts are included here to help the writer decide which campaigns to participate in. This example shows two days worth of deliveries of prepared meals to an organization called Mutual Aid Parkdale. Here's another campaign, East York Halal Meals on Wheels. Don't worry if you can't read the text, I'm just using this as an example of another method we use to register volunteers. We will use a Google form if circumstances require that we pre-screen our volunteers or if we need to capture additional information that may not be appropriate via a spreadsheet because of, say, privacy concerns uh, or other issues. Writers receive emails once or twice a week highlighting new campaigns and other volunteer opportunities. These email blasts also no notify us of any upcoming events requesting our support or that would otherwise be of interest to bike brigaders. Recent examples include an arts workshop for racialized writers and an invite to a screening of a new documentary about the bike brigade. Once I'm registered for a particular delivery, the coordinator for that campaign will send a text message the night before with a link to the delivery details. It brings up a dispatch webpage that contains all the necessary information to complete the delivery. You can see here that it provides names and contact info, special delivery instructions, and even buttons to instantly call or text the recipient. There are navigation shortcuts to each recipient, plus a map showing the overall route. The dispatch notes are formatted so they're viewable both on a computer and on a phone. Oh no, I think it's been And can be printed out if you don't carry a smartphone with you on rides. Oh, yeah, I see you in Discord there. Uh, I think someone is unmuted. Yeah. I'm hearing someone in the background. Thank you. Uh, now onto the day of the delivery. This is what I ride. It's a 2014 Giant Rome 2 hybrid. It's a bit of a Franken bike since every part save the frame and stem have been upgraded or replaced over the years. Uh, I have two rear panniers and a repurposed Fudora delivery bag, but the bulk of my capacity is on the bike trailer. It's a basic flatbed model with 16 inch wheels and an axle hitch. I have three old tubes that I use as bungee cords, as well as a stretchy cargo net to help keep everything in place. I think the most I've ever carried was 120 pounds of canned goods on the trailer, plus about another 60 pounds split between the panniers and backpack. Uh, then we have a fleet of hardcore riders with their cargo bikes. One of our volunteers, Chad, decided to celebrate his 50th birthday recently by hauling 350 pounds on his Bike Friday cargo bike and trailer. Uh, keep in mind while the video plays that he actually has no e-assist on this bike, and we have a couple of hills on this ride, so this was all muscle power. In the uh, the bottom gear. Haven't hit it yet. Okay. But I'm about to. Ah. <laughs> oh. There it is. Granny gear time. Yeah. So right. we count 170, right? They said they say 175. 175. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, you're good. Want to come up here, Chad?
Is this good? I guess it's well, you know what? I'm gonna get off the curb. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's 175 meals. That particular ride happens every week. And although we normally split up among, uh, or we do normally split that on, uh, up among four or five riders, those brown bag hot meals are prepared by an organization called Working for Change. They run a number of social enterprises seeking to train and employ low income and marginalized individuals. One of those businesses is a catering service that preps several hundred of these meals every week. The meals are then distributed to food banks or directly to the unhoused in various encampments around the city. Uh, here's another recurring campaign from the spring. Landrick is doing grocery box deliveries for the elderly residents of the St. Jamestown neighborhood in Toronto. This clip gives a good sense of the impact these deliveries have on members of the community. But of course, the most important thing they do is deliver food. Landrick Bennett Jr.'s day continues here at the St. James Town Community Co-op. A downtown food program that the Bike Brigade has helped keep going. Thank you so much. I've got it. <laughs> Landrick picks up a food box for a senior who lives on her own. Thanks, ladies. I'm carrying precious cargo. That is going to feed them, hopefully, for a full week. I need to get it to them. Can't stop. Can't stop. You get to see, with your own eyes, where these boxes are ending up. Who the people are that need this help. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I'll leave right here for you. Thank you. No problem. I appreciate it. No problem. This is a good hug for me. No problem. Thank you very much for the delivery. No problem. We need that. I need that badly. No. You have a good night, okay? Good night. Thank <laughs> you very much. No problem. Trini Philon is 70 and lives on a fixed income. I've been in isolation since the pandemic starts last year, March. And... Uh, it's not easy for me living alone because you are limited to yourself and you feel unhappy because I'm away from my family and I miss them so much. Trini says her rent is so high that buying fresh food is often difficult. We hope for that. But she tells me it's not just so the everybody. food that's in the box, it's that someone delivered it to her. It's very, very, very appreciative. At least I am important in the way that somebody is supplying my immediate needs rather than for me worrying. It's an unspeakable joy, really. The pandemic might have created the bike brigade, but Landrick wants me to know that it's here to stay. I won't stop. I want to make sure that I'm here to see us help as many people as possible in every way, in every situation. The most vulnerable of us need our help, and I can't say no to that. I won't say no. Hey, hey, how's it going? Long time no see. The pandemic has hurt everybody, but it's also brought out the best in us, too. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the behind-the-scenes software magic that ties all the pieces together. When Bike Brigade launched in March of 2020, it was essentially handled through a Facebook group and a spreadsheet. It's one thing to manage a handful of riders for one weekly delivery, but quite another when the endeavor grows to involve hundreds of riders, multiple deliveries each and every day, working with dozens of different partners, many of whom who have requirements that change from week to week and ride to ride. After briefly considering some off-the-shelf logistics and dispatch management software, we decided to build a custom solution in-house. It started off with Google Spreadsheets and Forms, then we added rider text notifications in June 2020, and then a big jump to web-based itineraries in February 2021. 
Since this is bike bike and not code code, I'm not going to dive into all the nitty gritty technical details. Uh, instead, I'm going to turn it over to Max Weitzman, our lead developer who launched this effort last year. This is a short clip from a talk he gave at a developer conference last month. Uh, he goes into the motivation behind creating the software and how equitable access to, te to technology shaped many of his decisions. And to do that, uh, I built a quote-unquote app, uh, which is not quite an app that I will tell you later. Um, and I'm just going to play a little uh, volunteer reaction to it. So this right here, where you press text, like, boom. And it's got it right there so that my delivery person knows I'm coming. Too cool. I love it. I, I love it. I'm going to send that message to Max. They're going to have a spreadsheet of like where they're delivering a bunch of stuff, a um, bunch of addresses. We're going to have a list of riders, maybe through Facebook, maybe through a mailing list. Um, and we just need to match them up, tell people where to go, um, and maybe collect some results. And when solving this problem, um, people should feel good doing this. Like It should feel personal. Um, they should feel connected. Um, technology shouldn't be a barrier, like you shouldn't have to install an app or even necessarily have a smartphone. Um, and at every point, I want people to feel that they're part of a community as they interact with a system that lets them do this. So how do I communicate with people? Um, SMS. Uh, you don't need a data plan. Um, you know, all our volunteers need is a phone that we can text, and we're going to send them messages. Some of them are automated, but most of them are going to be from people so that when they get those texts, they like you just have a phone number and you can text it back anytime and we'll respond. The app is just like a link. You can do so much with a mobile web. Um, you don't need to download an app. I don't need to like push updates to the app. I can just send you a link. This is your delivery. Here's your itinerary. Um, here's some buttons that like forward you to the texting app or the calling app on your phone. Uh, which Lanrick, like three slides ago, was really excited about. Uh, Max is going deep into the implementation details here, which I'm going to skip over for this talk. But if you're a software developer and are interested in this part, I'll include a link to his video at the end of this presentation. We'll pick up where he talks about where to get the software and how to participate in future development. Um, the third thing uh, is that we're open source. Uh, so all the code that I talked about is uh, on GitHub. Um, you can check it out. I hope that you can learn something from it. Um, it has a lot of patterns. Some of them are good. Uh, some of them are not so good. Um, so I'm a little bit anxious about open sourcing it. but. Uh, please like read it, maybe learn from it, maybe contribute, um, and uh, check it out. Yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, I see I'm running short on time. I only got about eight minutes left, I think. Um, uh, so I'm going to go pretty quick, the, uh, just two more slides here. I think most of us who have worked in the mutual aid space have heard of this slogan, Solidarity Not Charity. It just means that we're working from the bottom up to help um, and empower these communities rather than doing the charity thing, which usually implies you're just sort of airdropping money or supplies. And what you're really doing is just causing further dependency um, on, on, on those who are offering. Uh, I can talk more about that in the Discord if anyone has questions or, or would like to discuss that. And then very quickly, I'd like to end on this quote something I've repeated often, um, and that's, we don't have a problem with food scarcity, we have a problem, problem with food distribution. A recent 2019 study estimated that less than half of the food produced in Canada, only 40%, actually makes it far enough along the supply chain to feed a person. So that's less than half. That means 60% of the country's food output, or over 35 million metric tons, is somehow lost. Of that, it is estimated about 11 million tons is avoidable waste. That works out to an additional 289 kilograms of food per year for every single person in the country. Here are some photos I snapped at some of our, locally, our, our uh, grocery hamper pickups. Most of these are from a single food bank in downtown Toronto. 
They have taken over an old restaurant space, and it is usually filled floor to ceiling with surplus food donated from various supermarket chains. And in fact, there is so much that the workers there have often found it difficult to ship out food quickly enough before it spoils. This is why the bike brigade's efforts are so important. We are attacking the system by filling a gap in our food distribution system. As David said, food security existed long before the pandemic, and it isn't something that will be going away soon. That's why services like the Bike Brigade won't be going away either. If you're seeing the same inequities and injustices happening in your city or town and would like to follow what Bike Brigade is doing, we can be reached on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as the Bike Brigade. I've also included links to the media used in this presentation, and I can paste them into the chat and the Bike Bike Discord for reference. I only had time to show small portions of each video, so please check out the full versions if you can. Finally, here are my personal details if you'd like to get a hold of me afterwards to talk about Bike Brigade or Bike Sauce, or even just to chat about bikes. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and watching. And I think I've got about, we have what, five minutes left. Exactly, you're right on time. Actually, I'll put that last uh, two slides up in the meantime. I just want to say, wow. Wow. Anything else? Yes, like in a good way. <laughs> I practiced that so many times. <laughs> yeah, I'm hungry too. I actually haven't had, uh, haven't had lunch yet. So actually, I haven't even looked at who else was in this, uh, who else has joined here. Uh, so let's see, who's got hands up? Um, I don't think I have host status. So I guess someone will have to help me unmute if needed. Uh, I think Ed is first, Ed Hudson. Why doesn't somebody else go ahead? I've said a lot already today. All right, uh, I see Etienne is next. Uh, I mean, I've spoken too, so I feel bad, but uh, I'm gonna go, because I'm curious. Um, I guess I'm curious as if, now that you've gone through this process of small to big spreadsheet to software or whatever, like this whole journey, um, do you think there's, I guess, learnings or, uh, learning's not the right word, but like if another group wanted to do something similar, where do you think in the journey they would come in? Would they come in like with being able to use the software that exists now? Would they start with the spreadsheet based on learning? Like, I don't know, if, if this were to be ported somewhere else, at what stage do you think? That right, works. right. Um, I, I would say uh, usually for things like this, uh, not specific for this, but any kind of grassroots campaign where you're, you're where you're just trying to organize a lot of people together that doesn't have much of a formal structure. Uh, I find usually if you it's better for you to get a feel for that space. So I would not personally jump right into the dispatch software that we've developed. Um, you know, give a get a feel for uh, for how your group likes to organize. We happen to use Facebook groups. Um, another community might decide to do it on WhatsApp or Telegram, for instance. Um, and especially if you're starting from scratch, uh, I find in a lot of cases groups will try to bite off more they can chew. Um, you know, they may be inspired, and that's great. Um, but don't feel that you have to have this fancy solution running right off the bat. Uh, you know, we're more than happy and yeah, I don't want to speak for Max, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we would be more than happy to help other cities and other groups to, uh, to get this off the ground. But I know, uh, from speaking with some of our volunteers who have done this with some of the other, some other towns and cities, um, you do have to take into account the, I guess the, the local circumstances. Um, so even if you can't get this type of software up and running right off the bat, it certainly doesn't hurt to, uh, to go through and start off small the same way we did. Uh, okay. I see Claire has, uh, their hand up. Oh, you're still muted. Ah, hi. hi. <laughs> um, I'm Claire. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm super impressed by your community organizing work. Um, and I would love to peer behind the curtain in terms of like, what does it take to organize the organizers of this? Yeah. So, like, yeah. Yeah. Good question. Uh, because I am, I am really just a writer, one of hundreds of writers. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, I, I am in contact with the organizers. I do have a little bit of a peek into how they do it behind the scenes, but I know they have their own Slack server. Uh, I mean, I, th I think we're up to a couple dozen people who are working sort of behind the scenes, if not more uh, at this point, because we have so many partners we need to deal with. Um, but definitely if you want to use me as a point of contact, uh, either stick around on the Discord, we can trade contact info, and uh, I'll put you in touch with uh, with our organizers. I would love that. It's so beautiful to see beautiful organizing run. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, who is next? Uh, Roan from Vancouver. Hi. Hi. Um, so as I mentioned a bit ago, um, I was in contact with some of your organizing team like almost a year ago because I found out about your program and basically it blew my mind. Um, <laughs> and I was like, let's do that in Vancouver. Um, but as you mentioned, it's hard to start a project like that um, because it's really big. Um, and we definitely stalled out a bit because the excitement um, didn't match our capacity. Uh, luckily, we have a new person coming on to our uh, organization soon who's very interested in food security and has a big appetite to continue the work um, but we definitely stalled out at a stage where we partnered um, with like our local community fridge network and have a few dedicated riders that help transport food from their distribution locations with food banks um, and uh, food waste diversion hubs uh, to community fridges um, and it sounds like those possibly more people you've talked to who are kind of at similar stages of figuring out what bike brigade activities look like in their own cities because you can't transport a solution to every single location. And I was wondering what kind of documentation you had, if anything, um, that we could look at uh, just because we all come from a very diverse um, range of cities with different needs and like different weather patterns, like in Toronto, it's cold in Vancouver, it rains for like six months at a time. Um, <laughs> because I want to do it so badly, but I just like don't want to reinvent the wheel. And now that a year has passed, it would be really cool to know like what other people have figured out in that time because we all have limited capacity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I did actually uh, pass your name and your photo from one of the Zooms earlier to, to Rachel Wang. I think uh, you were probably speaking with Rachel uh, last year. So... I'm not sure if she's on the call right now. She may be busy actually handling our food share distribution today, um, but she does remember you. And she's like, yeah, she's she's very <laughs> she's very excited and uh, and very willing to, to 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 pick up the conversation again. And yes, like you say, and as I've seen, these grassroots effort, we're not by definition a formalized group. We don't follow a certain methodology. So every city, every town, every situation. Will be different um i don't know what we have in terms of uh hard documentation uh, i would not be surprised if there's not much of that typically documentation is the last thing that this type of group focuses on because we're so busy just trying to get things going and working and running smoothly um but for sure yeah if uh, if you think you guys are in a better space now to take this on uh by all means uh you know reach out to me talk to rachel i can put you guys connect you guys uh together again uh, yeah, we would love to help out. Okay, I think it's, uh, I think I'm running a little over time. Am I, Patty? You are, but you made a huge impact on a lot of people, I think. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay, that's great. So I'm going to still be hanging around on Discord, you guys. Uh, yeah, everyone can reach me there. Um, and uh, yeah, I would love to hear of uh, from anyone who has done this in another city, or if you would like to start something like this. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Amazing job, Brian. Well done. Thank, thanks, Brad. I'll see you soon. <laughs>